John warned me to be careful and keep my eyes open, and I did. I got a view of America that did not seem at all transcendental. As I traveled, I saw whites only signs at public water coolers, and blacks served here signs at side windows in restaurants. The message of exclusion was one I was familiar with in Boston, but it, here it was spelled out in signs. Then an indoor concert in a park in Washington, D.C. In an indoor concert at Washington, D.C., I encountered something glorious, a performance by the singer Miriam Makiba, who was in political exile from South Africa. At that concert, with the first racially integrated audience I had ever been part of, I learned what the word apartheid meant. And I had what I now consider my first experience of activist art. And it was an art of both protest and embrace. It took more experiences like that one and reading James Baldwin at 16 and coming out as gay and meeting my first partner who was my college roommate and a student of African, Ameri of African history and moving to New York City during the class wars of the 1970s when hip hop and graffiti were blooming in the Bronx and traveling to North Africa and spending time in India and constantly looking at art, old and new, and finally seeing the art that had seen the art that had been invisible to me when I was young. Through all these experiences, my eyes gradually opened to the political necessity of art and the political utility of beauty in all its many forms. I joined the New York Times in 1991 when the intensely political art associated with multiculturalism was cresting. Multiculturalism has proved to be a problematic concept, but for me, back then and now, still, it meant one main thing. Everybody coming to the table with all their colors, languages, genders, attitudes, and desires. At that table, we wouldn't just break bread. We cook up whole new cuisines, new kinds of nourishment, and everyone would get to tell their story, write their histories. You probably had to have been there to know the sense of optimism then. But the social and political climate were not on art's side. This was a time of terrible danger and loss with the spread of AIDS. Friends and lovers, artists among them, with whom we had expected to share the rest of our lives, were suddenly going and gone. Extraordinary art emerged in response to the realities of that time. But so did the repressive culture wars that began in reaction to that art. I sense that those culture wars are with us again now. I would say to anyone who imagines that America has achieved a state of post-feminist, post-racial, post-class, post-colonial, post-queer grace, you are wrong. Just listen to the international news. Fundamental work of advocacy and resistance in every area remains to be done. Can art do that work? I go back and forth in my thoughts about this. Since the market, the market has become so adept at neutralizing everything it touches, and we live in a culture of infinite distraction. But I think of the work that ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, did in the 1990s, using images and public performances to succeed in getting drug companies to release medications that saved lives. That was huge. I think of Ola Oguibe's monument for, for strangers and refugees, which brought the realities of otherness and exclusion out into the open and went further to pose an alternative to them, a prescription for civic health, and did so in a language that was both straightforward and compassionate. I hold on to the idea of art as a kind of moral empowerment zone, a set-aside place where new, different, improved, corrected versions of reality can be proposed and even maybe sometimes realized. I like to think that just by occupying that zone, artists form a crucial force of resistance. As the filmmaker Luis Manuel once said, Artists keep an essential margin of nonconformity alive. 
Thanks to them, the powerful can never affirm that everyone agrees with their acts. What the politically powerful, what the politically powerful can do, or try to do, is suppress art that they find threatening. And this has been true in the case of Monument for Strangers and Refugees, a sculpture that, as a gesture of cultural embrace, was created to permanently occupy its central site in Kassel, under far-right pressure in Germany, has been dismantled and removed from that site, with the assurance that it will be reinstated elsewhere. When it will, will be returned to visibility, however, is uncertain. Not at all uncertain is the reality that the reactionary, bullying, other-fearing political forces of my youth are back. A significant difference is that artists and curators like Olu and Adam and Magda are consistently, variously, and collectively speaking out. And now I hope you will give a warm welcome to two of those people, uh, beginning with Olu. Thank you. Thank you, Holland, and um, thank you all for coming out in this weather. Um, I'm not very much traveled in the United States, although I've lived in quite a few places, New York, Chicago, Tampa, Florida, um, but I haven't actually sprayed out. It's pretty much that axis. And, and uh, I've lived in Connecticut now for about 15 years or so. Um, so this is my first visit to Nashville. And I hope that I get a chance to see a couple of things. But we were joking about it the other day that when I was uh, a, a kid in Nigeria, I used to write country and western <laughs> music <laughs> and send, send my lyrics off to uh, scam publishing companies in the United States. So that was part of the dream was to become a country and western songwriter. Uh, that didn't pan out. Um, but uh, interestingly enough also, um, I should mention this, that all, all week long, last week I was actually busy buying uh, uh, LPs of Miriam Makiba's uh, music. So that's, uh, I don't know if you got to meet um, the former husband, uh, Hugh Messakella. Yeah. Back to country music. Um, and I don't want to be stereotypical because I'm in Nashville. <laughs> um, one of my favorite singers, not of the uh, younger generation, um, Willie Nelson, has a, a song with a line which says, my heroes were always cowboys. <laughs> Fortunately or otherwise, growing up, uh, I had no access to either television or cinema because I grew up in a, a very rural area uh, in West Africa. In fact, I was in a television program before I saw my first television set. People had to come back from the city and tell my parents, we, we saw your child in, on television. What was he doing there? As some of you already know, uh, well, a few of you already know, um, when I was two years old also, a civil war uh, broke out in Nigeria, where I was born. 
As a result, millions of people were internally displaced. And most of them moved from the cities back to their ancestral homes in rural towns and villages where there was no electricity, which is the reason there was no television there. <laughs> um, and so with no television or cinema, I had no way of uh, learning about cowboys. Uh, instead, my heroes growing up were riders and freedom fighters. And there was Chinua Achebe, uh, whom some of you may know about, whose classic novel, Things Fall Apart, was compulsory reading in school, thankfully but also whose famous character, Okunkwo, I very much identified with, despite reservations about the character uh, by the author himself. Okunkwo is a tragic hero who, having been shaped by deprivation and conflict with his father, arose to become what uh, in America you would call a self-made man. A bold, curt, swashbuckling high achiever who therefore was extremely short on patience and deeply afraid of cowardice or fear. As he watched his small community disintegrate under the pummeling blows of European colonial assault, Okunku also found himself alone uh, in the position that there should be a firm pushback violent if necessary, and that his people should not simply cow to the white man. However, having witnessed the might of British imperialism as it violently uh, destroyed other communities who dared to stand up to it, Okonkwo's people were hesitant to draw the same reprisal. So feeling uh, betrayed by the realization that his people had chosen the path of cowardice in the face of colonization, Okonkwo eventually took his last stand uh, by slaying a colonial messenger and then taking his own life. Beside Achebe's novel and its tragic hero, I also found much to admire in Achebe's critical and philosophical, uh, philosophical essays especially in the role of the artist in society. His first collection of essays, Morning Yet, on Creation Day, became like the scriptures for me. And then there was James Baldwin, whose personal story of growing up a child preacher and the son of a disciplinarian preacher uh, mirrored my own story and whose scripture-laden prose and sermon-driven polemics became a template for my own early writings. I had wanted to mention at the beginning, in fact, that I'm thankful to Magda for allowing me to talk about art because in the past, I'd always played the role of juggling being an artist and an art critic and a curator, so it's wonderful that there's a curator who can do that and there's an art critic who can do that so I can just talk about art. Um, but I mention it because I began by writing about art before actually establishing a reputation making art. And I drew a lot from, uh, at least in the, the style and language from James uh, Baldwin. And there were historical figures because as you may have discovered by now, my world of heroes was shaped not by the screen, but by reading. I read to escape the darkness and terrors of a violent home in a small rural town, caught between a glorious but quickly vanishing past and a marginal, uncertain future. Again, the other thing that I mentioned to some people yesterday was that my biggest aspiration was to go to uh, a theological college in Aberdeen, Texas. <laughs> because I love the pictures of the, of the campus that I saw in that brochure. Um, and because of the depth of my curiosity and yearning, I found myself aligning more with the authors that I read uh, 
who had male characters in their work. Beside literature, I read and loved history. One of my heroes was the West Indian campaigner, Marcus Garvey, whose name I adopted in school when I was 10 or 11. It wasn't a very popular nickname. Other guys had very popular nicknames, and mine was Marcus Garvey, the freedom fighter. I was like, what's that? <laughs> um, if my old school desk could be found today, perhaps someplace on it might still be found the knife carved inscription. Marcus Garvey, the freedom fighter. <laughs> the early path in what one might call uh, self-formation and identification would lead me to a certain idea of what one's place in the world should be and what role one could or should aspire to in history. Baldwin's monumental sermons Unleashing fire and brimstone, Achebe's engagement in Africa's colonial history and his terse position on the role of art and artists, Gavi's passionate demonstration that in order for any group to prevail in the battle of interests it must organize, those became the foundations of my own self-formation or self-discovery, as it were, and they would contribute to shape my aesthetic preferences. Chino Achebe's essay on art practice in the pre-colonial world of the Igbo, which is my uh, cultural group in West Africa, was particularly useful as a guide, especially because I had grown up in, in this rural community where residues of beliefs and practices from that period survived. Again, interesting enough, uh, all my all my ancestors and, and my father's side, uh, right down to my immediate grandfather, were uh, deity priests. Same on my mother's side, and same on my father's mother's side. Um, but then my father became a preacher of the Church of Christ. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's still the priestly calling in the family, but in a different direction. Um, and and, and uh, so these things that survived as I was growing up, they, they very much vanished now, but there were uh, resounding residues as I was growing up. Uh, and I had observed my parents and others in the community live and manifest the many creative forms to uh, uh, that the Igbo uh, produced. So that when Achebe wrote that among the Igbo artists, uh, among the Igbo, artists had lived and moved and had their being and that they made art for their community, that deeply resonated with me because I'd seen it in practice. As I became more knowledgeable about European art, I was also drawn to artists whose ideologies and practice reflected those formative convictions. I particularly liked the work of Goya and Coupe, uh, among uh, others. And among modern American artists, I particularly related to the work of African-American artist Charles White. In time, my own positions regarding the place or role of the artists have altered slightly, despite the nature of much of my work, which is uh, publicly known. And that's something that I'd be glad to, uh, to I, I'm actually quite glad to mention. Uh, suffice it to say that for now, uh, through greater exposure and perhaps knowledge, my ideas have also become a little more complicated Achebe had, as, as a child, grow, as, as a younger person growing up and reading Achebe, I was particularly fascinated by his, his uh, formulation of this strong position of the, about the role of the artist in society, where he'd said that art for art's sake is just another deodorized dog shit. <laughs> 
Now I'm not so sure, you know. <laughs> Deodorized maybe, but I don't know about dog shit. Um, I think that the very practice of making art complicates your views on art and art making. I, I came to have what I hope is a deeper understanding of form, for instance, and the intersections of form and agency. Agency, not only of the artist, but also of the work itself. And from this deepening, I've also arrived at a better understanding of the pre-colonial African art practices that remain central uh, to my work. For instance, I do a lot of abstract work. Um, and this isn't uh, often obvious to others, but it is actually partly informed by the fact that Igbo art from this, my culture in West Africa is mostly abstract. And not abstract in the symbolic, mystical way uh, that we understand so-called primitive abstraction, but rather in the sense of pure abstraction with no indexical or symbolic overtures. So I make a lot of work, paintings, prints, uh, that simply revel in the challenges and possibilities of form. Um, with that said, I have remained attached to the suggestion that among the multiple, multiple valences and possibilities contained in the agency of art is the possibility to convey I ideals, including humanistic ideals. I do not think that conveying humanistic ideals or any ideals for that matter uh, is the duty of art or artists. In fact, I've been quite clear on the point that for, uh, for me, the only duty of the artist, if duty is the right word, and I doubt that it is, uh, the only duty or responsibility of the artist is to make art. In exercising that liberty, or some may say creative compulsion, an artist could then elect or choose, as I've done in many instances, to make work that speaks to pertinent moments and issues within the humanist realm to different degrees of success. These are uh, the circumstances that frame some of my own work, especially those that most people have come to associate uh, with my practice. And I like to talk about just a few of them within the time uh, that we have. I've, I've sort of, uh, over the course of my practice, been drawn again and again back to a number of themes. And, and in fact, it's a, a struggle for me because, you know, maybe people who are familiar with my presence and, and social media would always find that in between the moments when my work is up there in some big global show or whatever, I spend a great deal of time just making small little paintings that are totally abstract, that have nothing to do with any of the social issues that people associate with my work. And I derive a great deal of pleasure uh, from making those little paintings or whatever they are, um, and whenever I have the time to, to do that. Um, at, the, at the beginning of my real proper practice, I was drawn to certain uh, moments and certain issues, uh, including the, the question of violence as it affects children, um, which is what this work is about. And, and a, a great deal of the work also draws from my personal experiences. And you find this in the couple of images that I'll share with you now. Um, I made this work uh, sometime in, in the 1990s, um, and 
for some reason, I actually know the reason. I think in around nine, in 1994, I made a work in London. I was living in Britain at the time, as you may tell from certain uh, uh, retentions in my accent. Um, I made a work about the Oklahoma bombing incident. And the work was about the children who were in that incident. And this relates to the fact, of course, that when I was a child, I was in a civil war. And what happens is you have adults engaged in political debates and conflicts, which children know nothing about. But the children are just as much victims, if not more, than the adults who uh, create these situations. So I found it very um, uh, pertinent to single out the children who were victims in, in that incident because they weren't part of any ideological debates or disagreements. They, you know, little children who went there to either see their parents or someone was doing a school run and, or you went here until I finish work and then we'll go home or whatever. And they were caught up in this. Uh, so I, I made that work and I think this particular image uh, which is called Mementos, comes out of, out of that. Because the, the way that art comes into uh, conflict situations or tragedies by itself, not necessarily true artists, is that when there's a tragedy, our innate desire for beauty, something to counteract tragedy and sorrow, emerges and people leave flowers and, um, you know, um, people prepare little places, altars more or less for children who are no longer there and so on. And I'm, I'm drawn to some of these things. And uh, following that, around the same time, I made this image also, um, which is simply called Boogie, and it's called uh, A Memorial to an Unknown Child. And then I made this, these are all in the 90s, and around the time that I moved to the United States, this one is called, simply called Keep It Real. And again,